All right. We're going to start this thing. Um, so, hey, everyone. Thanks for calling in. Um, you know, we gave everyone a couple minutes to call in, so hopefully we have the majority of people now. And um, tonight uh, we'll be doing a SESA second webinar ever on, um, you know, advice for your interview. I think uh, it's interview season for a lot of people, so um, we believe, you know, right now is a good time to be talking about this subject. And uh, we hope you find it useful. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, if you have questions, go ahead and uh, throw them up on the uh, discussion board. Um, if I see it while we're on a particular slide, I'll try to get to it. Otherwise, um, we'll uh, get to the questions at the end. So we probably have about 20, 25 minutes worth of um, material, and then we'll leave the, uh, the back end for um, questions. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, um, throw the slides up. Here we go. So as I mentioned, um, we're going to be doing some uh, tangible advice um, to ace your interview. And uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is David Pan. Uh, I graduated from Ohio State University. Go Buckeyes. Um, while I was in school, I also interned with GE and P&G. Um, so you know, I had some experience with what the process was like to get internships. Um, I've been with uh, Procter & Gamble for about four and a half years now. Um, doing some various roles, uh, started out doing product design and then moved into uh, working on technical marketing. What that means is whenever on TV you see, you know, they talk about a product works five times better than, you know, their competitor. Uh, we have to prove that, you know, the product actually works five times better. So I worked on that. And then now I uh, most recently have switched into a, a new role, um, actually working on marketing itself at P&G. Um, currently work on the Gillette brand, so work on uh, blades and razors. Um, within P&G, um, so um, I've uh, led various recruiting teams, um, so that, you know, this is kind of where some of my experience will be coming from uh, as I talk today. And then, um, so these recruiting teams include the Ohio State recruiting team and also the um, SACE recruiting team that P&G has. And then um, also currently, uh, or also for SACE, I uh, was one of the uh, founding members. So I've probably been working on SACE, one of the uh, longest people besides for the actual founders. Um, and currently um, in the marketing committee chair um, of SACE. So what are we going to talk about today? Um, we are going to talk a little bit about what to do um, before the interview. We're going to go over um, you know, how to prep for the interview and then... Uh, you know, structure of how to talk about your answers. A um, little bit of what I like to call story time. And then, um, you know, the closing, uh, how, how to wrap up um, a successful interview. And then, so let's go ahead and get started. So before the uh, interview actually ever happens, um, what I had uh, first listed here was the career fair. And um, from my past experiences recruiting, I often get questions on, why is it important, you know, to attend a career fair if, at the end of the day, all you're doing is um, uh, filling an online application? <laughs> and kind of the behind the scenes, you know, why why is it important to to win the career fair? Basically, what happens is, um, you know, we we talk to a student at a career fair. Um, we we kind of rate your resume, um, you know, if, if we think this person is a good fit. And then what we do is we take the people that um, we were impressed with at the, at the career fair, and then we go into our online system and look for these, um, these candidates. And you can imagine, you know, a big company, um, P&G, or some of our other sponsors like GE or Shell or Toyota, you know, you probably get out of a career fair like Ohio State, you might get, uh, say, a thousand students uh, applying or interested in the company. So how, how am I as a recruiter going to filter that thousand students of which say 300 or 400 look really strong on paper? So basically it's really important to win at the career fair. That sets you up to be able to um, get that initial interview. And um, I also have listed here um, career services. So before the, you, know, you ever go to an interview or even career fair, um, you make sure you utilize uh, the career services. Um, you've already paid for it. You know, it's part of your tuition. Your school's offering you this. Um, the career fair has uh, connections to recruiters, and what I have listed here is kind of these like quote unquote VIP only info sessions. So obviously, if you haven't heard about these before, um, it's probably you know you haven't been invited to them before. But uh, I didn't find out about these until um, you know my senior year, when my brother told me that um, a certain consulting firm was showing up on campus. Uh, he had heard from a friend. 
and you know through some connections, you know I was able to attend the uh, actual info session. But uh, you know that opened my eyes to the fact that there are companies that come to campuses and request career services um, to you know maybe give them twenty names, right? And you want to be you want to make sure that you're one of those twenty names. Um, that uh, you know the career counselor gives to these companies. Um, sometimes, if your school has honors programs, uh, the uh, recruiters might say, "Hey, I only want to talk to your honors students" or something like that. So, um, getting the connections is really important. So, before you ever even you know go to interviews, make sure you're utilizing uh, you know you win at the career fair and you you uh, maximize um, the career services office. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about mock interviews in the future. And career services usually can help you do that. So um, practice, practice, practice. You know, we've all heard practice makes perfect. Um, in this case, Google search is your friend. You can, uh, if you type Google search, uh, you know, interview prep, um, you'll get thousands of hits. And the big thing here is that um, we're not, you know, all of us aren't the most comfortable talking about ourselves. And it's something that uh, we definitely need to practice. Um, I just interviewed, you know, as I t mentioned, I just switched jobs, um, roles within P&G, and I spent hours, um, you know, researching questions to prepare um, and writing out answers myself um, to be able to, um, you know, uh, be able to think of the answers um, quickly um, during my interview. So first off, practice. Get a friend. Um, do it together. Actually, it makes a big difference when you actually talk out loud um, and hear yourself be able to do that. So make sure you do that. Um, think about the impact that you made on the projects that you worked on. We, you'd be surprised, you know, you go to these um, how to prep for an interview or career fair sessions and people always talk about, oh, talk about I, not we. And you'd be amazed how many people come up to me during a career fair and tell me about how amazing their teammates were but never once told me how amazing they were. So make sure that um, you talk about what you did. So get really comfortable with saying I, 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 you know, just when you practice with your friend, um, if, if you happen to say we, um, make sure you know, they, they kind of slap you on the hand and uh, make sure you uh, learn to say I. Um, think about what message you want um, the interviewer to walk away with. So if you're like this really creative person, um, but you never talk about how creative you are or give examples of you know, some of the creative solutions you come up with, then you know, the, obviously the recruiter is never going to walk away with that. So as you prep, um, you know, your various stories of what you want to talk about, make sure that uh, the stories can highlight the key characteristics that you think, um, you know, you bring to the table. So if that's creativity, if that's uh, you're very logistical and, you know, you're great at executing, uh, make sure you talk about those things. And then obviously this one seems kind of um, uh, elementary, but make sure you know what kind of interview is being conducted. Um, there's various types of behavioral, there's obviously case studies for consulting, there's, you know, panel interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, so just kind of get that information beforehand and know, um, you know, what to expect so you know how to prep. So as part of the prep process, um, know what, know why you want to work for the company or, you know, why you're looking for a job in that particular function of the company and what I mean by particular function. Like if you're interviewing for a, uh, a manufacturing job versus, if you're interviewing for a job in R&D, um, know why you want to do it. And I'll give you an example of why. So I was doing a mock interview with uh, my career services office back at Ohio State, and it was a mock interview for Coca-Cola. And yeah, I just woken up from a nap, and I showed up. I didn't do any um, prep for it. And first question I got was, why do you want to work for this company? And um, you know, I gave a very generic, you know, Coca-Cola is this great multinational company, you know, would, or international company would love to go work in other countries someday and, you know, kind of brushed it off. And then um, when I got my feedback, I got actually killed on that answer because basically if you can't show passion for that company, um, when they ask you why you want to work for that company, then it's a huge um, turn off for the company because they're looking for people who really, really want to work for them. And at the end of the day, when you have, you know, a lot of people all who are very qualified, it might come down to how passionate you are for the company. So some examples of how you can uh, you know, bring that to life are, you know, talk about some classes that you took. Uh, you know, I wrote here, if you took a product design class and you found that you're passionate about, you know, talking to consumers and finding ways to solve their everyday problems, you know, talk about that. You know, that fits really well for a company like P&G. Um, you know, if you have passion for sustainability or, you know, a company is leading innovation in some particular field that you're doing research in, 
Um, so talk about you know how uh, you know their connection is what is really makes you want to work for that company. So it's super important um, that you be able to nail this answer. Um, the next slide here is what are companies looking for and just listing out some uh, characteristics um, of what companies want and you have to know this in order to know how to prep. So um, grades are important but they aren't everything. Um, most companies just have a minimum requirement so just checking a box. If you've already gotten the interview you probably have already checked that box. Um, it's, companies are looking for your technical experience. We're all engineers, we're all scientists, so they want to know that you can think, that you can solve hard problems, technical problems. Um, they want to know that you can lead people. Um, you know, companies aren't hiring you just to be a you know, set of uh, paid hands. Um, they actually, you know, they're paying for you to be active and to come up with solutions and to be able to lead people um, to deliver those solutions. So that's really important. Um, initiative to take on problems. So people who can identify problems to begin with and actually can do something about it. Um, ability to work well with others. So much of what we do at work is uh, working in teams. Um, so that's super important. Are you going to be someone who no one wants to work with? Um, I've even heard that uh, for like certain companies, consulting firms, business schools, etc. Part of it is even like, do they want to hang out with you for happy hour? We spend you know eight, nine, ten hours at work. People go out afterwards for a drink. You know, do people even want to hang out with you? Um, thinking and problem solving. I think that's explanatory. Communication skills. I mean, the interview obviously, uh, the interviewers are going to be able to get that out of the um, the session. So. Can this person articulate what they're thinking? And also just priority setting. Um, you know, work is so busy every day, um, school's so busy. So just showing the fact that you know how to prioritize what's important um, and get you know what's important done first. Um, so hopefully that helps. Looks like no questions yet, so that's good. Um, the next slide goes into a little bit of okay, so you've made it to the interview. Um, you know, you started prepping, thinking of, you know, say six to eight stories of what you want to talk about. Now, how do you actually structure the story? And you know, some of you guys may have already seen this before. Um, so this, this CAR stands for Context, Action, Result. Um, C stands for so context. So as an example of you know, what this might look like, you know, an organization I am leading was looking to grow new membership. And you want to spend about 20% of your time in this, uh, for the answer on the context. Your action. So what did you do about this you know, problem that you had? You know, and in this case, I developed a survey to understand what prospective new members would want from our organization. I found that they wanted to meet recruiters and I planned three recruiting events. So you want to spend about 60% of your time talking about what you did. And again, what you did. You see the eyes in there, not the we. Um, and then result. So what happened um, with your, you know, through your great idea, through your great insights and action, what actually happened? So through these events, I was able to grow our membership by 2x and also help four students receive internships. So um, a lot of times students actually forget to talk about the result. Um, it's super important to, um, to talk about the result because that kind of gives the recruiter um, a scale of, uh, you know, that your idea was actually good. Um, and not just hey, an idea that ended up delivering half of what you guys expected to do. So um, it's super important that you include that there. So hopefully there's no questions on that. Um, so as I mentioned, like it's usually good to go in with an interview, I'd say an hour interview with at least six to eight strong stories that are very dynamic in how you can use them so that they can cover a variety of different topics. Um, so, you know, a story about your leadership experience that can be used um, in three different ways. So, um, obviously, you wouldn't want to use it three times, but uh, you need stories that overlap in terms of topics. So, um, this next part is probably something that um, might be new to people. Um, I called it here story time. And so, for those who actually attended the SACE National Conference and attended the workshop that Dennis Harutsu gave on story time, I'm kind of stealing from him a little bit here. Um, but basically, um, it's kind of the so what of your story. So what makes a good story, right? A good story is we read a book or we watch a movie. It's dynamic. Um, there's tension. There's a problem that's being solved. There's a hero that's coming to sit, you know, solve this problem. So as in the context of an interview, um, essentially, I mean, you're a storyteller, right? You're, you're, tell, tell, you're telling a story about your experiences. So um, you know, we want to understand like why you're doing what you're doing, um, not just the fact that, hey, my SACE president told me to go do this, um, and I don't really know why I'm doing it, right? But you want to explain, you know, what the impact is on what you're doing and frame it in a way that, you know, people will want to hear more about it. So, um, 
as I uh, I'll pull some examples up um, in this next slide, but and watch out here is don't bore your uh, interviewer with all the details, but give them the details that will uh, you know, make them wet the lips a little bit and want to continue hearing more. So just an example of how this is brought to life, you know, simply. Um, on the left is the example that I had previously given. So the organization I was leading was looking to grow new membership. You know, if you wanted to add some pizzazz, you know, some, some story and some tension to this um, uh, example, you can put the organization I was leading was looking to grow new membership, so that's the same as before. We hadn't grown membership in three years. So as a recruiter, all of a sudden, I'm very interested because, you know, why why haven't you grown membership in three years? And, wow, like you're going to go tackle a problem that's, you know, a really big deal. Versus, yeah, the organization I was looking to grow, you know, was looking to grow new membership, we've been growing membership, like, you know, for the past five years, doubling size just by, you know, being on campus because, you know, students are that interested or whatever, right? And so you want to kind of frame it um, in a way that uh, allows people to understand the magnitude of what you're doing. And then for the action here, um, you know, what I had written previously, I developed a survey to understand what prospective new members wanted from our organization, um, found that they wanted to meet recruiters, and I planned three recruiting events. So what I've added here was, and it wasn't easy because we hadn't established relationships yet with recruiters, so I had to work with our career services office to get their contacts, right? And then, you know, you can continue on with, uh, you know, I had to convince them to come to campus, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so, as a, obviously, as an interviewer, then all of a sudden I know, hey, it wasn't such an easy thing for you just to get these um, people to campus, right? It, you actually had to do a lot of work. You had to solve, you know, unexpected problems. You're able to adapt to new situations. And so, um, you know, you, you, you want to keep answers succinct, um, but at the same time, you want to add kind of this, like, so what factor. Like, why does it matter to me that you did this activity? Like, why is this important, what you did? So I hope that makes sense. Um, don't see any questions, so that's always good. Um, so as we transition to the next slide, kind of, so you've, you know, you've done your six to eight stories, um, you know, you've wowed the interviewer with your great experiences. How do you kind of um, solidify the, uh, the interview? So, you know, at the end of every interview, you have an opportunity to ask questions. So you have an opportunity to interview the company itself. Um, so this is your time to get to know the company and close the sale. And just to give you guys, you know, some potential questions that you might want to ask, um, I, I get this a lot from students. So um, you can ask about the company culture. Um, you know, you spend eight, nine, ten hours a day at work. Um, you have to enjoy where you work and the people um, that you work with. So, you know, we've all read stories um, of, like, Google and Facebook and, you know, the tech companies out in Silicon Valley and how, you know, they provide daycare and, um, you know, lunch and dinner catered and um, it's, like, you know, fun place to work. We all heard, you know, the dreaded corporate America. Why would you want to go work in corporate America? It's so stodgy and, you know, like so hierarchical and, you know, those type of things. So it's good to understand um, what the company culture is like. Um, the next question is um, that a lot of times I, I tell students to ask is about diversity programs. So obviously, um, you know, SACE is a diversity, um, you know, Asian American based uh organization. So, you know, is the company that you're interviewing for have any diversity programs um, in general and then also specifically for Asian Americans? And as we know, even in the university setting, a lot of times there are diversity programs for Hispanics and African Americans, but there aren't for Asian Americans, right? So it's good to understand, um, you know, what kind of diversity programs there are, how do they support diversity? And I'll give you an example of why this is important. Um, I had a friend who used to work in consulting, and he uh, mentioned uh, you know, I was talking. We were talking about diversity programs, and in his company, um, you know, there weren't as many diversity programs, and Asian Americans weren't necessarily supported um, all the time. And you know, he he mentioned when one of the uh, Asian American uh, employees actually got made a manager. So you know, it was a big deal. They actually like made a manager. You know, all the Asians kind of went out and celebrated because you know, finally one of us made it through, type of thing. And so um, you know. As much as it's, you know, as great as it is to be like a trailblazer and be that first person to make it through, um, it also may, you know, it's that much harder to be that first person to do it. So if you want to be that person, great. Um, if you want to be in an environment that's more, um, 
you know, that fosters diversity and, you know, values kind of diverse thoughts and, you know, different opinions and stuff, then, you know, that, that might be something to look for in a company. Um, obviously, training opportunities is super important. You know, most of you will probably be interviewing for, you know, new jobs, first-time jobs. So getting the right training, um, whether it be rotation programs or whether that be, um, you know, opportunities to attend conferences and get external, you know, uh, information um, that's important you know how a company supports that and then um, if you know I, I mentioned the the question earlier about um, you know when they ask you oh why do you want to work for company XYZ um, if you didn't get asked that at the beginning um, this is a perfect opportunity at the end um, to highlight that fact so you know usually they're gonna be like oh do you have any last questions or comments and this is your time to jump in with, yes, you know, I want to work for, you know, this company because, and then kind of list off your one or two reasons why you feel like you're a great fit. So this is your time to leave with a really um, inspirational why you're awesome for this job. And, um, you know, quick story, when I was interviewing for P&G, I, uh, you know, talked about why I wanted to work for P&G, why I thought it was a great fit, <clears throat> and the interviewer ended up, telling me a story for about 10 minutes of uh, relating to why I wanted to work for P&G. So he had created this new product that was helping um, people and he had a personal story about it and you know we just really hit it off in that moment. So you know, I really felt like I was able to uh, seal the deal in that case. And just some, um, some closing thoughts. Um, the first one is uh, transparency is great until it's too transparent. So what I mean here is like we all have lots of ideas of what we want to do with our life. Um, you know, we might one day, you know, want to go back to school and get an MBA or a PhD or even be a doctor. Um, we may want to, you know, start our own business. We may want to go work for mom and dad or whatever that, you know, we might want to do. It's great that you want to do all these things and that you're thinking about it. And people and companies appreciate transparency but it can hurt you in certain occasions. Um, so if all of a sudden you're like, hey, yeah, I would love to work for your company in a technical you know, R&D job for a summer, and then you know, next summer after that, uh, I'm thinking about working in business and you know, I'm double majoring in finance and I'd love to get a finance internship. Um, that ends up being a little bit too transparent for you know, that technical company that's hiring you and trying to train you as an engineer, and all of a sudden you're talking about also wanting to do like finance or something. Um, this happens a lot with people who are also studying pre-med. Um, so, you know, sometimes people who study pre-med or pre-dentistry, pre-pharmacy, um, you, uh, you know, you first off, you list it on your resume. And so it's great that you have it on your resume if you want to get a job that's in the medical field. Um, and partly, you know, people might want to put it because it, they think it looks impressive or I'm taking these extra classes, which is why you should pick me. But when you're applying to companies in an industry, um, one of the last things I want to see is that you're pre-med. And the reason is, again, like I'm hiring you, trying to train you, and hopefully get you as a full-time employee in the future. All of a sudden, you've now told me that you want to be a doctor. And, you know, why should I apply or hire you if next summer you're just going to go to med school, right? And so, um, you know, companies spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of people, hours um, trying to you know, train people. So um, great that you have life goals don't share all of them all at once with uh, the employer. Hopefully that helps. Um, be confident, don't be cocky. Um, so don't talk about why you're the best person in the world, but definitely talk about why you're great, um, you know, and you're a great fit with the company. Um, again, talk about your impact. Say I, don't say we. Um, you know, you can frame it with, you know, our team, we were given this problem, but then tell me what you did to solve it uniquely. Um, I don't really care about your amazing teammates and what they can do. Um, again, you know, a great interview starts way before, way before the invitation itself. Um, and what I mean here is by, like, for instance, if you're in a leadership role for SAS on your campus, did you set the right measurable results in the first place, right? If you're in charge of growing membership and, you know, did you set a goal to grow membership by 25 people this year and did you hit it, you know, and did you exceed it and you grew 50 people? Now you can talk about you delivered 2x the goals, right? And I mentioned how important the results were um, when you talk about your examples. If you never set a goal to begin with, how are you going to be able to talk about you know, the results that you delivered and why you blew them out of the water? So 
um, make sure that you set yourself up way before the interview with these, you know, the right goals and measures. Um, bring a bottle of water with you. Um, bring extra copies of your resume. You know, seems like common sense. Um, One-sided uh, resumes, please. Um, people, I think, are getting trying to be cute and creative um, with this whole. You know, printers can do front and back now, but. Uh, front and back does not count as one page, it counts as two, and I actually get really annoyed when I get resumes front and back, um, you're automatically kind of marked down. Um, rec uh, in terms of, you know, some companies need recommendation letters or references, um, or even if you apply to like med school or MBAs or something, um, if you're going to have someone listed as a reference or recommendation letter, I mean, obviously contact them and let them know, but also send examples of what you want them to talk about. Um, you know, like I, I've been approached before for um, to be as a reference, which is great, and I've had people actually follow up and call me about it, and you know, I'm more than happy to help. Um, but I don't necessarily remember all the little details of things that we worked on, and there's certain people where I definitely remember things that we worked on. But say that you were part of a SACE team, you know, and I don't necessarily know what you did versus I just know that your chapter did a great job, right? And I can talk on behalf of the chapter, but it's hard for me to talk on behalf of you. So you're not helping me be able to talk about you. So, you know, the I, and then in this case, you, right? I can't talk about you. So, um, you know, send examples. Like, make the person's job super, super easy. Um, and just give them examples of what you want to talk about. And then lastly, you know, be professional. So most companies make an assessment in as little as a minute, you know, for sure in five minutes, whether it's a positive or a negative impression, they know right away. I say at a career fair, I know within like 30 seconds whether or not I want to spend more than five minutes with this person. Um, you know, within 30 seconds I know if I'm asking you two questions or if I'm going to ask you five. So it's super important to, to win that, um, you know, immediately. So um, that's all I have prepared for today. Um, I'll uh, open it up for questions. So if you guys want to type any questions in the, uh, in the comment section. So one of the questions, how do you transition into the close? I know I've tried it before, but it didn't come off well. Um, any advice? So one of the, so I'd love to hear a little bit more um, because usually I feel like a transition in the close, um, the company representative, you know, they have their set of, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten questions they're going to ask, and then they're going to switch over and be like, you know, what questions do you have? Um, so, I mean, that's usually, I think, um, uh, when, you know, when it starts into the close. If the question is more um, in terms of the last part of, you know, well, why you're the best candidate, um, I think that usually happens when, you know, you ask your one or two questions, and then they're going to be like, great, um, you know, do you have any other questions or last comments? And then that's when you can be like, you know, you jump in with, you know, my last, I just want to end this you know, interview with the fact that, you know, your company is the best for me or I think I fit really well with your company because of, you know, and then list off the one or two things at most of why you feel like you fit with the company. Uh, I don't, uh, hopefully that answers the question. So I see, you know, the first question that I see here, um, when someone asks, when someone asks me about yourself, what do you usually say? Um, so again, that goes back to um, practice, right? And I think um, there's probably some really good examples if you search on Google in terms of like elevator pitches, you know, the, the 30 second pitch. Um, but usually it'll include um, obviously your name, what you're studying. Um, and then I think if you have any type of expertise or specific types of interest, um, I think that's a great opportunity to, to throw it in there. So, hey, I'm David, uh, you know, studied mechanical and engineering. Uh, I currently work at P&G and uh, in marketing, have a passion for um, digital marketing and, uh, you know, utilizing um, you know, influencers to drive uh, better brand engagement. Um, you know, happy to be here in this interview today to talk more about it or something. So um, I think, you know, that's when you have to uh, spend that time um, actually prepping ahead of the interview. Um, so the question that Jake just pinged me with, if you do a lot of services in school, what kind of impression does that give to interviewer? So I'm guessing that means if you do a lot of uh, activities um, in, uh, in 
uh, school. Um, so if any, if that's what it is, uh, or if that's not what it is, ping me. But um, obviously, uh, you know, I mentioned what interviewers are looking for. One of it was leadership. So if you do a lot of activities in school and it's just to um, do activities, not necessarily that you're leading things or that you're uh, providing an impact, then that doesn't help. Um, so basically, you know, I think what you want to do ultimately is pick one or two things and really, really focus on those and um, be able to actually give an impact. Um, I, I personally, I found it hard when you have more than two things to really, really be able to actually uh, give more, you know, give yourself um, your time and uh, your your mind capacity to actually work on those activities. So I'd say, you know, pick one or two things that you really have a passion for and, uh, you know, really spend some quality time. And at the end of the day, it's um, it's all about what impact you had. So it's not necessarily that you have to be president of an organization or vice president, um, but you have to have made an impact on the organization. So um, a lot of times I think organizations will allow members to, you know, kind of take a one-off activity and, you know, lead that. So um, if you're not president of something, definitely look for those opportunities. What's the next best thing to do if you don't know the answer process to a technical question? So I guess, I mean, this will depend on what industry you're interviewing for. I mean, I'll give you my fallback answer, given that I work in consumer goods. Um, and then uh, well, we'll start there. But um, basically, if you're interviewing for consumer goods, your fallback answer, if you don't know how to solve a case study, is, oh, I would spend time you know, talking to the consumer and figuring out what they want, right? And I actually had an interview when I was at P&G, they were like, hey, you know, the guy put a cell phone on a table and he was like, tell me what you would do to a cell phone, um, you know, to make it better. And my fallback answer, you know, I would spend time talking to people and understanding what they're, you know, expecting out of their cell phone. Do they want a bigger keyboard? Do they want a bigger screen? Um, you know, are they getting the right audio quality that they want or do they want something else, right? And, you know, I think by starting there, it shows that, hey, you're, you're able to um, frame up uh, and find, you know, that's initial starting point of how you would go solve that problem. So I think even if you don't necessarily know, like, you know, how to solve the technical question, because um, they aren't necessarily looking for you to have the exact answer, um, I think they're looking for you to be able to, like, frame up, hey, this first step I would, you know, hey, I don't know the answer to this, but, um, you know, what would you do to go about solving it? So would you, you know, refer to a certain person or look for, uh, you know, certain uh, research or whatever, and how would you get the answer? And it might be, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the whole Google is your friend. So this might be an opportunity also to spend some time, you know, how, how do you answer, like, a highly technical question um, in, a, in an interview? Yeah, one else has questions. How do you tackle questions that stumps you? Alvin asked. The, the so my biggest struggle is I I love I, I I hate silence. Awkward silence is one of my uh, least favorite things in the world. So um, you know I tend to just try to jump immediately into an answer. And I think the biggest thing is um, you know advice I've been given is you know take thirty seconds and it's okay just be like hey you know take thirty seconds real quick take a deep breath gather your thoughts. Um, and the big thing is, again, you know, context, action, result. Hopefully at the point you've already, you know, come up with six to eight good stories. And as I mentioned, the stories need to be pretty versatile. And then you can, um, you know, jump in with the right structure. Even if you don't have necessarily had the best answer, I think if you can structure things correctly, um, you know, that definitely helps. And a lot of times, I mean, people will bring like a little portfolio thingy um, to their interview. And I think it's okay if you really quickly want to jot a couple notes or just be like, hey, you know, I want to take one second and uh, you know, write a couple things down, gather your thoughts, and then um, start answering the question. Okay, so John's helping answer the tech question stuff. Yeah, so I mean, I think Jason, you asked a great, you know, your question about the technical stuff. I, to be honest with you, I haven't um, been to like super technical interviews. Most of them have been behavioral. I think you know, most of the time they kind of trust that uh, you know, you did the engineering program, that you have the technical skills, you know, you have the grades and stuff. So. Um, that might be something that would be great to, to utilize your uh, career services office for. Any other questions? How do you direct your attention on two-to-one interviews? Um, okay, so a lot of times if you have a panel interview, so what's um, something really good, um, you know, that, of what SACE helps to provide and how you can, you know, maximize SACE 
is, um, you know, obviously if you're interviewing with a company that supports SACE, for example, um, you know, SACE has a connection with someone in that company already. And most of the time, you know, people are more than happy to spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes with you to help prep for an interview. And, you know, I, I've been in situations where I know a candidate's coming in um, and I, I get to see who's on their interview schedule. And a lot of times, um, if they're coming into the business I'm working on, I actually know who's on that interview uh, panel. And I can give people kind of a heads up that, hey, you know, when you're in this interview, the person in A is going to be highly technical and want to know technical answers. So when that person asks you stuff, you know, talk about your research in a lot of depth and show um, that you really understand your research. Person B um, isn't going to care so much. They're a manager. They're not a technical person. They want to know about your leadership skills. You know, talk about that. Or, you know, this person has this hobby or whatever, and I know you do too, so you, you can hit it off by that. So definitely leverage your resources um, when it comes to that. When it comes to two-to-one interviews, um, you, you know, in two people, how do you direct your attention? I think it's just the, obviously the person who asks you the question you want to spend most of your time with, I think, but um, I would just kind of go back and forth just as you would talk to your friends in a conversation. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a conversation with two people. So view it as you're talking to two friends and kind of just, you know, work the room, go a little back and forth. But uh, I would say focus a little bit more of your attention on the person actually asking the question. Um, what should you do after an interview and how often can you follow up? After the interview, it's definitely, um, you definitely want to send a thank you email. If you don't have the exact interviewer's email, send it to the person who coordinated um, your day visit or your interview and hopefully they'll forward on your thank you email. It's always really nice when you do get that thank you email. In that thank you email, um, you know, someone, even at a career fair or something, um, you know, someone might be interviewing 10 people in that day, a career fair, someone might talk, have talked to like 30, 40, maybe even 50 people. So it'd be great if you send a little reminder of who you are or something unique about you in that, uh, in that uh, email. I would say interview a little less, so definitely career fair. Um, so, hey, you know, I came up to you, we, uh, my experience in whatever research, um, you know, just to trigger my memory again. And then um, just say, hey, thanks, appreciate it. I would love to, uh, you know, uh, chat more in the future if, uh, if the opportunity arises. Um, I would say, you know, a week after, definitely you can send an email. Um, and probably uh, like a month after, too, um, if you don't hear back. I think the biggest thing is um, just reading the person's response. If the person's really like, hey, you know, we're trying, we're getting you through the system, a lot of times I'll be like, hey, please keep in touch with me because I realize I'm busy. Um, and I might not always remember to keep up with someone, but um, I'm okay with you messaging me. I'll write that. Um, if someone's like gives you a very short answer and you know they don't seem like they're that interested, then you know don't follow up that much. Maybe a, a week and then a month after. Um, I'll have people that follow up with me like for a six month period of time because I'm trying really hard to get the person in the company, and you know an opportunity just hasn't opened yet. But I continue to tell the person to keep in touch with me and. I respect the fact that they actually do keep in touch with me um, and really can uh, appreciate that and uh, it helps take something up my mind knowing that they'll um, would you pick your employee based on his attitude. I think if all else um, is equal, I mean assuming person A and person B have the same qualifications and are equally capable. Um, I would definitely pick someone that I think uh, I would get along with, you know, their attitude or, you know, their their hobbies and personality. And it isn't even so much like they have to have the same hobbies as me. They just have to have uh, something that's interesting, right? Whether you run a half marathon, whether you do Taekwondo, whether you play basketball or love food and blog about food. Um, people just want someone who's interesting, right? Um, those people you can go out and have a drink with. If you have to travel all over China for two weeks with someone, you know, you don't want someone who all they do is sit at home and do nothing, right? Or play video games or, you know, it's nothing wrong with video games, but, um, you know, you want someone who has stories to talk about, right? So um, I would say, I mean, that's not the most important thing, but I, I definitely think it's up there. Um, and so much of what we do at work is team-based. Um, you have to be able to get along with people. Um, and you have to be able to like read people. I mean, there are people at work that I work with that, uh, 
you know, you have to kind of pet their ego a little bit and you have to be able to work out with those people and you have to be able to work with people that, you know, need a confidence boost and you have to be able to provide that. So you have to be able to adapt and you get that experience working in, uh, doing leadership experiences and uh, being part of different organizations. Someone is going to a P&G recruiting day tomorrow. Um, examples of questions they may ask. So I'm not going to give you exact examples, but um, I think this is a, a good point. Um, when you prep for uh, an interview, um, you know, and you go on the company's website and you, uh, you know, do your homework and your research, um, Usually, I think there'll be something on the website that kind of gives an indication of uh, what type of person they're looking for and what type of questions they might ask you. So, if you know you're interviewing for a company like IDEO or a highly creative, um, you know, product design company, um, or you know, even a company like Under Armour or something, I think they might, you know, being kind of a newer entrepreneurship, you know, entrepreneurial organization. Um, you know, creativity might be a huge thing, right? And so you definitely want to prep for examples uh, of how, you know, you've been creative and came up with new ideas. And, and not just ideas, because, you know, the, the great advice I've gotten before, ideas are a dime a dozen. Everyone has ideas. It's those people who can actually take ideas and be able to do something with them, right, that, uh, that are useful um, and make an impact on an organization. Um, I'll give you an example. For P&G, I mean, on our website, I think we talk about... Um, uh, our PVPs, so our power, or sorry, our um, principles, values, and purpose. Um, and so, you know, you'll probably get questions based on making sure that y your value system fits with our value system, because that's really important in the company. Um, I think on the website it talks about power of mind, power of people, and power of agility. So, um, power of people is how you lead people, power of minds is how you're able to think through problems, and power of agility is how you're able to deal with change. You know, the world's changing so much these days. Um, how we market it to consumers, how we design products with consumers 20 years ago is no longer the same th way we do it now. Um, and, and so, you know, how do you tell me about a time that you led a team and the, the project objective changed? And, you know, now you had to do something different. So, um, that, uh, spend some time on the website and you should be able to get a feel of uh, what the company might be looking for uh, during your interview. Um, if you want to leave contact info, okay. So contact info, um, you can like find me on LinkedIn. So David Pan, I'm happy to connect with you guys there. Um, and uh, if you have questions, I mean, send them through the uh, like David Pan. So my email for SACE is David Pan at uh, SACEConnect.org. Shoot me an email with other questions. Any advice for freshmen going into interviews? Um, so do a couple more questions. So advice for freshmen. Um, awesome that you're in this session, assuming that the person asking me this question is a freshman. Um, certain companies um, won't take freshmen, uh, so that's unfortunate. There are other companies that will. Um, I know for a fact P&G takes freshmen. We're always looking for highly qualified freshmen. Um, General Electric takes freshmen, and I know this because I was a freshman when I uh, worked for General Electric or after my freshman year. Um, advice for freshmen going into interview, I mean, you've already done 99% of the work because you were one of the only freshmen that showed up at the career fair or, you know, got the interview. Um, the rest of it, uh, I'd say, you know, if you interviewed beginning in the college, it's probably very similar, right? Like, talk about your experiences, um, talk about why, you know, of the freshmen, you're awesome. Um, again, don't be cocky, but be confident. Um, and I think the big thing for freshmen here is, uh, it's okay to talk about your high school experiences. I would say even up through sophomore year, it's still okay to talk about your high school experiences. Uh, when you get to junior and senior year, you definitely, um, unless it's some amazing high school experience, you probably don't want to talk about it too much. Um, and so, yeah, freshmen, talk about you know how you led your National Honor Society or your student council or math club or whatever you happen to be um, part of. But uh, it's okay to talk about that. And it's actually really hard for freshmen because, you know, you go from a senior where you were in leadership positions to being a freshman where you're no longer in a leadership position. So that's why um, you definitely still want to talk about uh, some of your high school stuff. Um, but also look for opportunities where you can start leading our, uh, you know, even if you're not president of SACE, how can you take on an initiative as part of SACE um, and, you know, start developing the, uh, the college leadership experiences. Any other questions?
We probably have time for like one more. Um, and if there's no more questions, I mean, um, I'm always looking for opportunities to improve too. So if you guys, um, you know, something was particularly useful uh, and you want to send me a note, um, again, david.pan at saysconnect.org. Um, something, you know, you thought didn't make as much sense or I talked too much about a certain topic, definitely let me know. Um, I'm open to feedback and that's, you know, how I can improve. Um, so I'll give Jake one more second to see if there's any other questions. How much time do you typically spend preparing for interviews? Okay. Um, amount of time I spend preparing for interviews. So I mentioned I just recently changed roles um, within p and I had to go through the whole interview process. Um, I probably spent, for a one-hour interview, I probably spent about five hours maybe thinking about stuff and coming up with stories and um, something that I do a lot is um, I, I mentioned go to Google, find sample questions, and I actually um, type out my answers. Uh, it allows me to be able to practice. It's kind of like when you rehearse a speech. Um, you know, you're going to practice with note cards or whatever. Um, I actually will take the question, I'll type out my answer. I actually type it out in the car format. So on the left side of the page, I'll put a C and then I'll put the A and then I'll put an R. And then um, I'll type it, you know, C, this is the context. A, this is what I did. R, this is uh, the result. And so, um, and then basically I kind of memorize, you know, I go over that script over and over again. And then, um, you know, that makes it so that that story stays in my head and uh, I'm, I'm prepared for it when time comes. So I spend quite a bit of time um, prepping for interviews. I would say whatever time you would spend doing a speech at school, I would, I would do the same thing for an interview. Um, toughest question I've been asked. I don't, I don't know if there's a toughest question. I mean, I thought the uh, the cell phone example that I had been given uh, that I gave earlier that I was asked was kind of tricky because I didn't. I was like, you know, a junior in college. I didn't really know what they were looking for. Um, but uh, you know, I gave you my little secret. Talk about interviewing consumers, and you can get out of it. Um, and for a company like PNG, I mean, we're all about consumer products, so it is all about talking to consumers. Um, okay, we have a specific question here, so we'll take this one and then one more if there are any more. Does PNG accept people who apply for position and in internship during fall and reapply again in the spring? Um, there's no use per se in reapplying because your profile uh, is lasts a year. Um, so I if you got an email saying that you didn't uh, pass or whatever, or you're not um, being looked at, uh, you unfortunately have to wait an entire year, um, so next fall. Um, if you did not get contacted, um, that means there's potential that you could get f uh, be a fit with the company, or uh, maybe a recruiter said, you know, uh, they're going to have to take some time to get back to you or whatever. Um, then I would, uh, you know, try to leverage states contacts or whatever to see if, um, you know, you can get in touch with the recruiter to have them look at your profile again. Um, or, you know, if P&G happens to show back up on campus in the spring, um, when you talk to the recruiters, definitely let them know that, uh, you know, you applied in the fall and, uh, you know, uh, so that they can look you up in the system. Okay. Any last, last one question? We've got two minutes. Jake is typing. Okay. So big shout out to Jake. He's my tech guy for this uh, for this session. He's got all this set up and he's weeding out the questions for me. Okay. Um, how large of a deal is the testing component of the interview process? I'm assuming this is a, a PNG specific question. Um, because I, uh, I don't know of other companies that do all the different testing. But if it is, um, the testing component is more just kind of like we talked about GPA and, you know, there's like a minimum score. So um, when it comes to P&G assessments, there's two of them. Uh, one is a, a personality assessment. One's a kind of an IQ test. Uh, IQ test is kind of a, a minimum score that you have to achieve. And then the uh, personality assessment, uh, 
I don't even know how they score it. Um, but basically, if you don't pass either of those assessments when you apply online, um, or you have to pass both, if you happen to fail, quote unquote, fail, whatever that means, um, either of the assessments, then unfortunately the company can't do anything, um, or the recruiters can't do anything to try to get you in the uh, in the company. They uh, have policies in place. Um, when you come on your day visit, uh, again, this is PNC specific. You take another assessment. Uh, the point of that one is to make sure you didn't cheat on your uh, IQ test. Um, I, I call it an IQ test. Uh, they call it actually a reasoning test, not an IQ test. It's a reasoning test. Um, they just want to make sure you didn't cheat on your online reasoning test. So they make you take a very similar one uh, when you come in person. So if uh, if you're able to pass it online, uh, I've heard there's no problem of you passing it in person. So. And I think they send you uh, practice questions and stuff so you know what to expect. All right, Jake's typing again. Okay, great. Um, so hopefully, again, um, this stuff, some of this was uh, useful. Uh, you know, we called this session tangible advice because uh, I was hoping to give some people some insider information and or some tips, um, you know, that I have found successful through, um, you know, my interview process and whatnot. So I hope this has helped. Um, again, if you have comments or feedback, shoot me an email. Um, um, David.pan at saysconnect.org. David.pan at saysconnect.org. Um, and if you have any you know, follow-up questions, definitely shoot me an email. And uh, we will call it a session. So, Jake, I don't know how to close this out, so I'll let you do that. And uh, have a good night, everyone. Talk to you guys later.